Hi, how you doing? Welcome back to this lecture series on the ethical implications of emerging virtual reality and augmented reality technologies. In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about empathy. Virtual reality technologies are often described by VR boosters as empathy machines. The term popularized by VR filmmaker Chris Milk in his 2015 TED Talk. The idea here is that VR can mediate a kind of greater empathy or compassion for others. Here's how Milk puts it in discussing his UNICEF and Samsung sponsored VR film Clouds Over Sidra. When you're inside of the headset, you're not seeing it like this. You're looking around through this world. You'll notice you see full 360 degrees in all directions. Um, and when you're sitting there in her room watching her, you're not watching it through a television screen. You're not watching it through a window. You're sitting there with her. When you look down, you're sitting on the same ground that she's sitting on. And because of that, you feel her humanity in a deeper way. You empathize with her in a deeper way. And I think that we can change minds with this machine. So Chris concludes that VR is a machine, that through this machine we become more compassionate, we become more empathetic, we become more connected, and ultimately we become more human. This is in contrast to film, which only provides a viewer a window. Milk contends that VR allows the viewer to step through the window and become part of the virtual world with transformative potential. Framing virtual reality in this way is not unique. Most emerging media have been theorized as having the potential to extend the human ability to connect with the inner life of another human being. But treating this potential uncritically can be ethically fraught. Bimbasar Iram analyzed two VR films that attempt to convey the experience of refugees, including one by Chris Milk, Clouds of Sidra, and another called For My Son. In humanitarian films like these, the appeal of VR lies in the possibility that virtual reality can bridge the gap between the real and the mediated experience, which is crucial for motivating humanitarian aid and action. Yet Iram's analysis highlights how the medium of virtual reality is still subject to the same constraints of ideology and power hierarchies that are evident in other representational tools, such as film, including the prevalence of stereotypical images, the challenge of how to address the invisibility of refugees, and where their voices are only heard after they pass through ideological frames that perpetuate existing inequalities. Who is placing the camera and where is another question that Iram asks. A greater presence, sense of presence doesn't remove these constraints and at worst, it may be concealing them from view. What I want you to remember is empathy is not something that automatically happens when you put on a virtual reality headset. Janet Murray writes that the technological adventurism and grubby glamour of working in emerging technologies can make it really hard to figure out what's good or bad from what is just new. Showing people sad circumstances via a headset will not make them any more or less relatable than showing them something on TV or photos in a newspaper. In fact, some 2D photos are worth a thousand virtual realities. A compelling story, a real story, it's going to engender a lot more empathy and motivate aid better than uh, just a VR experience without one. A really good example of this is the criticism that Mark Zuckerberg faced for this video, where he watched a video filmed after the 2016 hurricanes in Puerto Rico with Facebook's head of social virtual reality to plug the Oculus products. All right. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, we are live in virtual reality. Yes, I think the first place that we want to go today is, um, is Puerto Rico. Uh, go quickly teleport there. All right, so now we are, we are um, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, hold on a second. And you can kind of get a sense of what is, we're on a bridge here. Um, it's, it's flooded. Uh, you, you can get a sense of some of the the damage here that that hurricane uh, that the hurricanes have done, and um, I mean, this is one of the things that's really magical about virtual reality 
is you can get the feeling that you're really in a place, right? I mean, it's, I probably should have mentioned this before, but Rachel and I actually aren't even, I think, in the same building in, in, uh, in, in the physical world here. But, totally I mean, different place, we're here, but... I mean, it, it feels like we're in the same place and we're making icons. Described as cringeworthy and tone deaf for using a natural disaster to push their products. This example further highlights how shallow the empathy of virtual reality is. When we watch something in virtual reality, we don't automatically shed our identity and our sense of self. Zuckerberg's humanitarian visit was done from the comfort of his Menlo Park office. And this example of VR disaster tourism highlights how that distance is maintained. As Kate Nash discusses, VR brings the audience into a relationship of false proximity with the subject, suppressing or diminishing any actual critical response to the documentary context. Grant Bulmer develops a theoretical argument against the claim that VR mediates empathy. Bulmer argues that empathy is based on a flawed neuropsychological assumption that we can ever know the experience of another and that the kinds of affective sensory experiences afforded by VR are often conflated with this flawed understandings. Instead, Bulmer proposes the concept of radical compassion to understand VR's power in this regard, which refers to an ethical stance that refuses any attempt to experience or even completely understand the experience of another, but instead embraces an openness to understanding and refuses assimilation into one's own self. Bulmer argues that his concept of radical compassion refuses to reduce the other in the name of reductive tropes of connection or association, as VR industry boosters often do. We can also be critical of efforts to create greater empathy in other ways. Sam Hefluthi points to Talspin's workplace empathy training technology demo, in which a user fires a virtual human, Barry, who sobs or reacts angrily depending on the user's approach. To highlight how greater empathy is simply a tool for the managerial class to resolve the affective harm to workers under capitalism, while continuing the underlying exploitation that causes that harm. As Mandy Rose suggests, it's really difficult to disentangle this humanitarian tech for good purpose from the clear ethical concerns surrounding privacy and surveillance that are associated with VR and the misuse, the overuse um, and the false use empathy. And with that optimistic ending, thanks for checking out this video in the series. Don't forget to take a look at the full Ethical Implications of Emerging Mixed Reality Technologies report, link in the video description below, which has further details on all of these aspects and references to many additional resources on this topic. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I hope I'll see you in the next video. Catch you later.